You're listening to Gender, A Wider Lens. I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Since 2016, my practice has been exclusively dedicated to gender questioning teens and families impacted by gender dysphoria. I also work with gender questioning teenagers and I facilitate at support meetings for families and individuals who have been impacted by gender issues. We're curious about the concept of gender and how it's unfolding in the wider culture. Join us as we look at gender through a wider lens. Lisa Littman is a physician researcher who is trained in preventative medicine and public health and in obstetrics and gynecology. Her experience providing reproductive health care to teens and women and her public health training inform her research about gender dysphoria, desistance, and detransition. The findings of her 2018 Parental Reports publication about rapid onset gender dysphoria or ROGD, generated some hypotheses about the potential role that psychosocial factors play in the development of gender dysphoria. Dr. Littman is currently the president and director of the Institute for Comprehensive Gender Dysphoria Research and serves on advisory boards of GenSpect and the Gender Dysphoria Alliance. Previously, she has held academic positions at the Brown University School of Public Health and the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Today, we talk to Lisa about her latest groundbreaking study on the experience of 100 detransitioners, which was just published in the last several weeks. We talk about some of the most astonishing findings there, and Lisa also reflects on what she's learned since getting embroiled in a controversy that she frankly never expected. She shares some of the possible reasons why the topic of affirmative medical care has become so polarized, and she points out that patients get hurt when clinicians pledge an allegiance to a particular approach rather than prioritizing the well-being of dysphoric people. Here is our wonderful conversation with Dr. Lisa Littman. Hi, Stella. How's it going this morning? It's going very well. Um, How are you? I'm doing great. I'm very excited to have Dr. Lisa Littman on our show. So good morning, Lisa. Good morning, Sasha and Stella. (laughs) It's great to be here. We're so happy to have you. Of course, we've both known you for some time, and um, we are interviewing you at a really great moment because you have a new paper that has come out, and there's a lot that you have probably learned and discovered along the way during your, your road researching gender. So thank you so much for being here. We have a lot of questions for you. <laughs> um, Stella, what is on your mind? What do you want to ask Lisa first? I suppose I feel that Lisa has been through an extraordinary few years. I don't think anybody I know, and I know a lot of people in this world, has been through such an extraordinary phenomenon as Lisa Littman, if I'm honest. I really do. I think that study, the first, the original study, the ROGD study that was released in 2018, was a game changer. It it led to Abigail Schreier's book, which was in turn a game changer. And I think this study, the detransitioner study, will also be a game changer because we're getting finally our hands on data that we need in this this very nebulous world where it's very hard. So I suppose my my question, my first question for you, Lisa, is what is your kind of what is your synopsis of what what why or how is this a problem to to discuss these issues why have you been vilified when all you've wanted to do is carry out academic research what is your kind of feeling now you're a few years in it yeah that's a great question i um i was not expecting the kind of pushback that i received after i published my first paper because i feel that I observed a phenomenon in my own community. I did my due diligence of reviewing the literature, seeing what was there, analyzing social media, fi- you know, finding discussion about these cases and using methods that have been used for decades without causing any outrage in any other study, um, just went forward to ask questions of what is going on? Why is this happening? How is this different than previous um, types of presentations of gender dysphoria. And so I feel, so I was doing what I, I think any responsible scientist would do is to ask these questions. 
um, especially in the context of this global change in the type of patients that were presenting from care. Previously, it was middle-aged males or male children. And then over a period of 10 years, it was teenage females. And so it would have been irresponsible not to ask questions. I mean, if you would think about any other, any other type of specialty to step away from the emotional aspect of this. But if you were a doctor who treats breast cancer and for decades and decades and decades, the typical patient was a middle-aged woman or, an, or, or older. And then in the period of 10 years, now most of your patients were teenage boys. You know, that's a shocking change. And to just say, well, business as usual, it's, you know, we don't know if the type, if this condition is the same as with previous generations. So anyway, so I did this research. There was enormous pushback. There was enormous support also. But I think, you know, in retrospect, now knowing what I know about the discourse around this topic and sort of the the players and the beliefs around this, I think, you know, obviously it's very polarized, but I think part of this the issue with all the pushback is that there's one perspective, which I think has become a little bit ideological, as opposed to welcoming all information that comes in. Because if you care about the health and well-being of, of all people who experience gender dysphoria, you're going to want to hear all the pieces of the puzzle to understand what's happening. Um, and what I believe has happened is that some individuals and groups have really pledged loyalty to one particular approach, the gender identity affirming approach, and place that above prioritizing the health and well-being of all people um, experiencing gender dysphoria. Because if you are prioritizing people, it's important to know about people who detransition, whether mm -hmm. they have regrets or don't have regrets. And so... Um, so, yeah, I think that's part of the problem is this polarization between two different models and then people really becoming very, um, you know, very strongly in favor of one. Yeah, I've, I've, that's such a good point. And I've heard you talk in other interviews about if, if doctors are pioneering a new kind of treatment, it would be very unusual for them to only be interested in the positive results and to ignore the negative results. And you, you also mentioned a kind of a conflation that you see happening where one perspective seems to indicate being uh, supportive of trans people and the other isn't. So can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, so this is something that, that I've observed, and I think this is something that's really wrong with the discourse, is I believe the, the way it should be is there are a lot of ways in which to support people who are transgender. But what has come about is that this allegiance to the gender identity affirmative model is that the concept that fast tracking access to hormones um, is conflated with support for transgender people and anything else, regardless of if those anything else is actually going to be more beneficial to transgender people is, you know, is called transphobic. And this is just, this really boggles my mind that these definitions are so narrow and have become so pervasive. And so your first study was really about uh, these teenage ch children. It was such a good analogy you made about the breast cancer. I thought it was such a really good framing of if something unusual is happening, shouldn't we explore it? And really, could you, for anybody who hasn't kind of studied this, could you just give a quick synopsis of that and what led you to do the D-Trans study, just to give, you know, anybody who doesn't know you, although everybody should, <laughs> just to give them a quick kind of heads up on it. Sure. Well, so it all started, you know, my background is I'm a physician. I'm trained in obstetrics and gynecology. I, um, I'm also trained in preventive medicine and public health. And so I noticed in my own community that one after the next teenager was announcing a transgender identification um, in numbers much greater than you would expect. and Like on social media or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when the first two came out, I was like, wow, that's great. I'm so glad they're comfortable and that they could share this information. And then came the third, the fourth, the fifth. 
And around the fifth, I started thinking, huh, this does not make sense based on what the world literature says on the prevalence of this of this condition. And somewhere after the fifth and the fifth, sixth or seventh one, I start I decided that I needed to research this. And as I was intrigued by this, because these kids all came from the same friendship group and there was nothing in the literature to suggest anything like that, um, I looked at the social media around this topic. And what I found was something, you know, was really some very unhealthy content in which um, individuals were um, asking whether certain things or certain experiences meant that they were trans. And the, and the answer was almost universally, yes, <laughs> yes, it does. And there's really a push to transition as soon as possible, or you regret it. And this is how you deceive your parents and your doctors in order to get cross-sex hormones. And additionally, there were these echoes of praise for people who were transgender at each step of, of transition or announcement. <coughs> And then there was this really mocking and maligning of people who were not transgender. So um, in terms of, you know, cis people don't understand, cis people are out to get you, they're, they're boring, they're privileged, blah, blah, blah. And so this struck me as very consistent with what's been studied around eating disorders and sort of the social contagion aspect of it. Um, and then I went online and I found some parent narratives to see, you know, maybe it's just my little tiny town in my little tiny state that, you know, that this <laughs> is happening in. And at that time, you know, just a few years ago, there was almost nothing. Like I had to really look to find these, situ these, you know, people talking about this. And I found a couple of websites where parents were describing that their kids became gender dysphoric out of the blue in the context of friend, friend groups, um, often after being immersed in social media and that, you know, that the doctors basically shamed the parents for even asking questions about, is this right for my child? And so what I saw was not hateful or, transphobic or anything like that. Um, but it was really the, the tone was much more in a sense of if this is true for my child and if this is going to help my child, I will get on board. But I don't think I'm not sure that this is going to, to help my child. So anyway, so with that, I started doing my research and you know, long story, also long. Um, uh, I met several detransitioners along the way and just some really amazing people who had been through a lot in their lives. And it struck me as really, um, really disturbing that nobody wanted to hear their stories. No, but they were getting pushed back and shut down. And that's what brought me to what, what Sasha said, this idea that Doctors could have an intervention and say, I only want to hear from people who had perfect outcomes. I don't want to hear from anyone else. Um, just strikes me as bizarre. Yeah. And, you know, you, you talked about you, you talked about something that reminded me of my own kind of introduction into all of this world, how like you started to observe something with teenagers and then you went to go look for are there parent reports about this? Like, am I just kind of losing it? Is this something unique? And what really blew my mind when I started doing this research was what you said, which is that doctors were kind of chastising parents for even asking questions. And that was so striking because it's one thing to notice that young people are, you know, part of some phenomenon. It's another thing that the medical establishment is dismissing the, the parent reports, which are always really important in child medicine. Like, so I'm wondering in, in your background in medicine, can you just make, is there any precedent there to where a child will come into the pediatrician's office or to a doctor's office with something and then the parent is completely dismissed when they share their perspective? Is that common in medicine or is that really weird? Yeah, I I have not heard of it. It just seems that as a responsible doctor and a responsible therapist, you would want to gather as much information as you could about a um, person who's going through something. And um, yeah, so this struck me as very surprising. And part of this 
part of the pushback that I observed is what made me think that there's really something going on here that, you know, that to demonize people who don't share your beliefs seems, you know, it, it seems surprising. And so a parent asking questions about, is this right for my child, is demonized as like, oh, you're transphobic. That doesn't make sense. A researcher asking questions about, well, what about this particular thing? You know, or even, you know, e- even the participants in my study, at one point there was a, someone who um, said, oh, this is like asking the Ku Klux Klan about, you know, about the rights of black people. And, you know, it struck me as, so wait a second, you're saying that these parents of children are the like the Ku Klux Klan? That doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. Um, you know, and I think in a non-ideological position, you would say, okay, you know, the parents who, you know, are in these other studies that are, you know, support the affirming perspective, there are parents who believe transition is going to help their children. And then the parents who participate, you know, some of which participate in my study um, or who are frequenting certain sites, you know, instead of saying, oh, they're evil, maybe parents who believe transition is going to harm their child. So, you know, that's where I think we should be, that these are parents who love their children and just have different beliefs about what's going to help them. And instead, it's been like, oh, they're, you know, they're like the Ku Klux Klan. It's it's so. a, it's a, there's an extraordinary level of exceptionalism with gender dysphoria and trans identification that doesn't seem to occur in other fields. Like it seems to be the only condition where the the patient comes in and says what they need and kind of leads the treatment as such. And uh, this is happening even to the extent of the child leading the treatment. And uh, with that, the undermining of parental authority is it's a big deal in my life. I've studied it a lot and I'm very interested in it. And I think it's one of the most insidious aspects of this, because when you undermine a loving, a previously unloving, engaged parent, and suddenly you decide that they're transphobic and they're like the Ku Klux Klan, you've you've really lost a huge amount of, of care and and concern for that child because the parent is mostly on the side of the, the of the child's long-term health in a way that nobody else is doctors aren't to that extent so it seems so much is lost and the second point point I wanted to raise here um is when I realized I didn't believe it when I was first told that detransitioners voices were were being closed down I thought that 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 couldn't be that is so awful that just couldn't be because it's it's just so egregious. And then I realised I was wrong, that they were being closed down and that I would imagine it was difficult for you to have this study. I was I would imagine it has been a difficult road to get this study out. Am I right or what? what where was that? Um, n- actually, this one was pretty straightforward. However, a study I did after that, more recently I recruited... Um, on social media, which is some lots of researchers recruit on social media, there was a um, really an orchestrated attempt to to undermine the data. So there were people, you know, so we shared the information on social media and then individuals would post like, hey, let's mess with the data. I answered the questions, you know, I shouldn't be eligible for this study, but I answered the questions anyway, or I put in all fake questions or, you know, like all sorts of things. Let's all do this. And then so there were people not only saying, you know, yes, we should we should mess with the data by by filling out false, um, you know, false information and fake answers. But we're going to, um, you know, encourage other people to do so. And so I actually had to shut down. The recruitment at that time and relaunch it in a different way in which individuals were screened with interviews. Um, but I think that's unprecedented. I've never, you know, mischievous responders is something that, you know, people are aware of, you know, that when you, when you survey teenagers, there's going to be a couple of wise guys that are like putting in crazy answers. Um, but I've never heard of a community basically trying to 
you know, to it's break like down, sabotage, to completely to sabotage. sabotage it. Yeah. And so, so that is really concerning, you know, and I always try to make comparisons to the research that supports the affirmative approach, because as a scientist, the rules should be the same for research, no matter whether you like or dislike the findings. And, you know, were people doing that for the U.S. trans survey? I, you know, I hope not. And I, I didn't hear of any. This is the first time I've heard of such an orchestrated attack. I mean, and, you know, all in all, at the end, you know, the study is much more robust now because it's not an anonymous study. I screened every desister or detransitioner by having an interview. So thank you for doing, <laughs> for doing that. But um, yeah, so but this first study, my study that was just published occurred a little bit earlier. So um, I wasn't on the radar yet. And it's some, amazing. You know. One of the interesting aspects of the many interesting aspects in this study was you recruited 100 detransitioners um, before detransition had really become known as a concept, because it was all recruited between 2016 and 2017, when really most people didn't even, they were basically saying they didn't exist. What was the word I was told? Vanishingly small. Because I was in that world in 2018, we were doing the film, and I kept on talking about detransition. I was told, Stella, it's the numbers are vanishingly small. Really, we cannot give time to a detransitioner in this film. It's it's, it's ridiculous. Thankfully, right. I, I, I held my own and we got it in, but I was really pushed back against. And you were recruiting in a year before that. So yeah. it, it was a different world. I don't think people who are really not involved in this world realize how different it was three or yeah, four years right. ago. Yeah, it's a totally different landscape now. It's so easy to find articles and studies and groups now. But when in 2015, 2016, 2017, it was like digging for a needle in a haystack. So it, it is remarkable. And can I, can I ask, too, on that topic, you define detransitioners for your recent survey in a very particular way that focuses on medical detransition. Is that accurate? Because I, even in the study, you referenced that there were some other surveys that included desistance, but you, you had a specific definition. So before we launch into it, can you define like what was it that you were looking for specifically? Right. And so because this is such an early um, area of research, the language is evolving. And so people are using it in different ways. And so that's why I felt like I needed to be clear. So some people will consider detransition as to be the reversing or stopping a transition that was medical, like cross-sex hormones, or surgical. Um, other people will include social transition with that, so that an individual who just socially transitioned might um, reverse. And so some people might call that a desister, and some people might call that a detransitioner. So, um, so I felt it was important that I define, and I'm not saying that this is the only definition for detransition, but I felt it was the the it was the clearest, you know, to designate I was studying a particular pop population. And so you were studying individuals who had started with medical intervention and then stopped their medical intervention. Right. And the way that I that I um, set up the eligibility or the questions in the survey was was whether people had transitioned by using or having one or more of puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, anti-androgens, or any surgical procedure, um, and detransitioned by any of the following, one or more of the following, stopping cross-sex hormones, having surgery to reverse changes of, of, um, from the transition. And so that's how, you know, that's the, that's the focus. That's the sample that I, that I got. And, one of the most helpful things in doing this research is that I collaborated with two individuals who had detransitioned because this was really, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of public information about it. They helped one with the survey creation. So we wanted to make sure that the questions and answer options were relevant to people who detransition and relevant to more than just one experience. So, um, so that was really helpful, but also they helped with the recruitment because some of these these forums were ve were private. But I also reached out to a couple of public um, 
public sources as well, like the listservs from WPATH and the APA and um, and SexNet. One, one thing I noticed with this survey, this latest study about the detransitioners, was the real neglect or lack of quality treatment a lot of them received. I saw that 71% thought that it was something like it was their only option to feel better was to transition, and they have now detransitioned. I would feel very angry if I was part of that 71%. And then the other number that jumped out was 24% have gone, is it, have gone back to the clinic to tell them that they've detransitioned. And therefore, three quarters, 75% haven't gone back. So 75% of people who've, who have detransitioned on your survey, and that was 100 people back in 2016, 2017, they, those clinics don't know. They think we've done great treatment and they don't know because they aren't checking. Right. And that's that's exactly right. And, you know, there's so many reasons not to go back and inform um, somebody that perhaps you feel mismanaged you or did not provide adequate care. Um, So what I've what I've heard is that people are people are angry. People are ashamed. Um, Some people feel that telling a clinician wouldn't change anything because they're so gung-ho about this treatment. Um, and then there are also logistical um, issues like, um, why should I travel and pay money for an appointment just to say that this didn't work or that, you know, this was not the right uh, and th- there's treatment There's also for me. the fear of being vulnerable because they might get dismissed and might, there's every reason that they'll get dismissed. There was a famous uh, video that, well, when I say famous in our world, that went kind of viral there in our world a few weeks ago about a man who went back to a, a therapist and he, he was detransitioned and he was trying to explain where he was at and the therapist would not hear him. The therapist just refused to, to, to kind of acknowledge his truth. It was heart-wrenching. Yeah. And I think that's part of what we're touching on about this ideology of really seeing the world in a very narrow way that that people just can't hear or listen to or accept information, even when it's right in front of them, like a person telling you this is what happened to me. Um, You know, that just it's surprising to me. We hope you're enjoying this episode of our podcast. We work very hard to maintain high quality content for this show. We're grateful to Rhyme and Genspect for sponsoring us. Rhyme, or Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving long term care for gender variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. Genspect is an international alliance of parents and professional groups whose aim is to advocate for parents of gender questioning children and young people. Now back to the show. Yeah, and you know, we, we see this happening too in IATDD, which is the um, association we put up for information about detransition and uh, trying to help people connect with therapists. And we have really sensed that even though we explicitly say we support detransitioners, we believe in detransition, we hear you, and we are really um, very aware of this phenomenon. Individuals who contact us through the website are incredibly leery and nervous and have lost the trust of therapy so badly that it's really hard to repair that kind of damage. And, you know, when I hear the affirmative clinicians talk about detransition in this dismissive way it is absolutely so cruel and it's it's just going to drive the detransition experience further and further underground rather than treating this with compassion and maybe even a little humility for the the medical establishment to say oh god we might have actually done something harmful we have to believe our patients when they say this was harmful to me and it's really bizarre for in the field of medicine for doctors and scientists to be just outright rejecting the possibility that an experimental treatment wasn't as helpful as they thought. Yeah. And I think you're exactly right. Is like there needs to be a lot more compassion and, and humility for this. And, you know, I've been surprised, you know, I've watched the evolution of people who don't want to accept that transition doesn't work for everyone. And it started, you know, and how they respond to, to detransitioners. So in the beginning, 
it was like, oh, well, detransitioners don't exist. And then it's like, well, they exist, but they're, it's so rare and numbers too small to even, to even matter. And then it was, oh, well, some people detransition, but it's only because of discrimination. Like they were happy with their transitions, but, um, you know, it's because of, of other people's poor treatment of them or minority stress that they had to detransition. And then now with my study where I have people of many different experiences, then it's like, Oh, well, those detransitioners, we don't like their attitudes. You know, they, they just kind of clock them as, you know, inappropriately calling them transphobic, which is basically now it's being used to mean, you know, not, not accepting that transition is beneficial for everybody. You know, and I think, you know, transphobia is a real thing and we need to limit the definition to, you know, to, to transphobia, which is, which is terrible. It's a bad thing. It's discrimination. It's people with ill, you know, intentions. But if you start calling, you know, questioning whether transition works for everybody as transphobia, even when it's people who have been harmed by transition who are telling their stories, like this is, this is not a great way to go. It's, it's the ultimate, ultimate form of gaslighting. I mean, we use that term a lot and I, but I can't think of any example that I know of that is such a blatant form of gaslighting. It's like, no, actually, you weren't harmed in the way that you say you were harmed. That's, right. that's so ridiculous. And and we're not even talking about this new kind of subjective sense of harm. You know, we talk about like people needing emotionally safe spaces. We're talking about physical harm, the permanent loss of certain functions of your body and body parts. I mean, it, it's so crazy. And then I also think about a new um, kind of justification to add on to your list there, Lisa, which I think you outlined it really well. I think some clinicians are saying, well, this is all part of a gender journey. Um, I've heard affirmative clinicians say, well, you know, of course we change and evolve. Like, yeah, at 15, you aren't the same person at 25. And like, yeah, our bodies change too, you know, that's a normal part of development. And another incredibly warped and twisted interpretation of human development through this lens of gender identity. So there are a lot of ways that very ideological clinicians are trying to spin this story but I think what what's hopeful to me about your study and your survey is that normal people who aren't knee deep in the world of gender identity see these experiences of detransitioners and they can't they can't spin it. I think more people are becoming aware that something really harmful is happening. And aside from the few very ideological kind of zealots this is becoming really clear. I think your study helps to demonstrate that. Um, and I, I wanted to touch on something that you talked about in the study, which is contact with a the therapist. You know, Stella, you mentioned that people had been getting really poor treatment and care. And um, more than half of the participants saw a psychologist or psychiatrist before they started the medical intervention. And the majority felt that the evaluation they received by the doctor or professional was not adequate. And 65% reported that the clinician didn't even evaluate whether the desire to transition was due to anything else. So this is a majority of people considering embarking on this very serious medical journey, I guess, who didn't really feel like anyone was curious or slowed down to explore why, what's going on, is there anything else behind this? Can you say anything else about that? I mean, that was really remarkable to me, though I knew it because I know this world very well. Yeah, and I think that's part of what um, Stella touched upon about this exceptionalism. Everywhere else, before you embark on, you know, treating somebody with something with permanent effects you would evaluate them to see whether they have a condition that would benefit from this. And what informed consent should be is really a um, conversation or seri series of conversations where patients can, and, and the doctors can understand what the, discuss what the risks, benefits, and alternatives are. Um, and this seems to be this exceptionalism in this field in that it's moving away. They're seeing this evaluation as un an unnecessary delay. 
Um, and so I think that's part of the issue. Um, and for the participants in my, in my study, they did, not only did they feel that their evaluation was inadequate, but when I asked about the counseling that they received about transition, I gave options of whether it was appropriately accurate about risks and benefits, whether it was not positive enough about benefits or too positive about benefits and not negative enough about risks or too negative. Yeah. And so about a quarter felt that it was accurate, but maybe more than 40% felt that their clinician was overly positive about the benefits of transition. And so, you know, that's, that's concerning. And again, this is not a representative sample. This is not, you know, everyone who sees a clinician. This is, these are detransitioners, but these numbers are concerning and they do fit with what we're seeing in terms of the belief system around fast tracking um, transition. So, I mean, I've thought about trying to, to explain it to people who really aren't in this field about this the belief of the need for fast tracking as the most compassionate and, you know, positive way to, to, um, to treat people versus an exploratory method. And so what I've been playing with is thinking about it in terms of chest pain and heart attacks. So for example, if somebody comes to the emergency room with chest pain and says, I have chest pain, I'm having a heart attack. And the model of care is, I believe you. I affirm what you're saying. You're right. You're having a heart attack. You would have no reason to say otherwise. We need to get you right down to the cath lab for angioplasty. Um, and there's no time for an evaluation. And so anybody who gets in the way is, you know, is, is going to be harming you. And everything that gets you right down to angioplasty is going to be helping you. And I feel like we could call that the heart attack affirmative model. And so this is related to how gender is treated. But let's let's look at it another way. So somebody comes to the emergency room with chest pain saying, I'm have, I have chest pain, I'm having a heart attack. And the doctor can say in this other model, I can see that you're, you know, that you're in pain. We need to find out what's causing the pain so that we can give you the right treatment. And this is going to involve asking you questions and maybe doing some tests because chest pain, it could be, you know, pneumonia. It could be a musculoskeletal problem. It could be a pulmonary embolus. It could be, uh, it could be reflux. It could be, and it could be a heart attack. But because you would treat these differently, then we need to explore and we need to find out how your chest pain developed. So let's call this the chest pain exploratory model. Um, and so in the exploratory model, there is, you know, there's time for asking questions and doing tests to find out what the problem is because the treatments are different. So let's say, for example, though, that so in the affirmative method, this could be helpful if a couple things are true. If it was true that everybody who thought they were having a heart attack actually was having a heart attack um, and that the treatment helped everybody and nobody was harmed, then I think this would be a perfectly fine model. However, when you start to see complications in people with other things, it casts doubt on it. And so um, if I were going to step now into the gender world, you know, this idea that you need to shut down the research that shows some people have pneumonia and some people have reflux and some people have anxiety attacks or some people are hurt if you don't do an EKG and do blood work and, and do a, a history and physical. So, um, so yeah, so in our world, it's really the affirmative model, which is, all right, if you say you're gender dysphoric and trans, you are, you should have transition as soon as you want it based on, you know, puberty um, versus okay, you, you feel dysphoric, we need to find out why you're feeling dysphoric, because it could be many things. I think that is such a brilliant analogy. And it's so helpful to just give us a concrete, alternative way of thinking about this. And what's really coming to my mind is that 
I think this is actually a problem in a lot of areas of psychiatry and mental health. Because like you said, with a heart attack, there are some concrete tests that a hospital or clinic can run to help the doctors determine what is the causing factor here. But with something like a mental health condition, we don't really have that. Gender dysphoria is not something you can test for. And actually, I am aware that even with something like ADHD, I know of young patients who go online and self-diagnose and they show up at their psychiatrist. And I've heard psychiatrists say, let's just put you on the medication because obviously you're distressed. There isn't a lot of time for a long two-day evaluation. And if the medication works, then we'll know that you really had ADHD. Which we also know that's not quite accurate either because again, these are psychiatric and mental health conditions don't have a kind of targeted fix like diabetes, insulin, boom. It's like a straightforward relationship. That's not how mental health works. And that's obviously not how something as deep and profound and important as gender dysphoria and a sense of identity works. So I feel like we're tapping on something that is a really broad issue right now. Just following on from that, I just recently read an article about Ritalin, which is often prescribed in Ireland for ADHD, and how it impacts people without ADHD in the very same way as it impacts people with ADHD, which is a kind of showstopper for me because it's then like, well, then it just impacts. (laughs) It's not like heart medicine or something. And and doctors say (laughs) that if you don't have it, it will do this to you. But if you do have ADHD, it will have this opposite effect. And that's not accurate. It's just a wash of chemicals in the brain. Um, I want to talk about the condition that dare not speak its name, according to some uh, psychological associations. And that is rapid onset gender dysphoria, which is a term you coined really for your 2018 paper. Did you see it in your detransitions paper? Did you see it manifest on any level, Lisa? Um, Actually, um, yes. So just to just to go back is so I coined the term rapid onset gender dysphoria to describe this phenomenon, which is what I was seeing and reading about where a teen or young adult became gender dysphoric and trans identified during or after puberty um, in the absence of having a childhood history where they had observed signs of gender dysphoria. And so that's a mouthful. And so I needed a shorter way to say that. Um, And so I came up with rapid onset gender dysphoria because it was neutral. It described very in a very short way um, and it and it was nonjudgmental. And so that's why I came up with this word. And it's not unusual to have phrases that describe things. I mean, so plastic surgeons recently have been talking about um, Snapchat dysmorphia and um, the Zoom boom in plastic surgery. Um, you know, to describe something they're seeing. And of course, it's not a diagnosis, but people describe what they're seeing in words. So just to, just to set that out there the, of how the term came about. Um, and so through the first study, my, the hypotheses that, that were generated was that psychosocial factors, so such as um, psychological, mental health issues, trauma, um, social influence could contribute to the development of gender dysphoria. Um, so that was my working hypotheses. And what I had found in the ROGD study is that parents describe these really unusual peer group interactions that are very suggestive of social influence. So what they described was that one more or even the entire group of friends became trans identified in a similar time frame. They described a group of friends who actively mocked people who were not transgender or LGBT and heaped praise upon people as they came out. And so what came of that, what the re- results showed were that, you know, 60 percent of the of the groups described mocked people who were not LGBT and about 60 plus percent of the target individuals had an increase in their popularity when they announced that they were going to transition or when they announced that they were transgender. So I I looked for some of those same things with detransitioners. And so to be clear, 
what I got in this detransitioner study was a wide array of experiences. I was not expecting everybody to have an experience like um, psychological issues, everyone to have an experience with discrimination. So I have this wide variety of experiences and one group of, of the, the sample did have these um, events and experiences that were consistent with what I would call rapid onset gender dysphoria um, or what I would call psychosocial factors, um, including social influence. So the, the items that I saw that were consistent with a social influence aspect were that, yes, there was a subset of these individuals who belonged to friend groups where one or more people became uh, trans identified and transitioned before they decided to. Um, there were groups that um, mocked people who were not transgender and people whose popularity increased when they announced that they were going to transition. Um, there were other aspects of social influence that came out in the data in that I think approximately a third when asked to reflect on why um, their past identification of trans said that somebody told me that the feelings I was having meant I was transgender and I believe them. So I think that's, you know, right up front, a social influence in the interpretation of one's own feelings. Um, and then there were about 20% of the participants who felt pressure to transition and that pressure came from a person or people. And so there are, there are several quotes that came up in the narratives about um, being pressured by the clinicians who thought that, you know, this was a panacea for every, you know, for every ill, um, people being pressured by their partners, people being pressured by friends, and people being pressured by society, either by told, being told that they were wrong being a lesbian or the the societal message that if you're even thinking that you're um, transgender, then you are and you should transition. So, yeah, so that and the psychological issues as well. Um, you know, the people who found that, um, who believe that their gender dysphoria was caused by trauma or mental health condition. Um, yeah, so all of that really does support the findings that mm -hmm. came from the first paper. There are two, two things that I want to lift up here. So first of all, you talked about the importance of the friend group. And I've also heard many, many, many families tell me that their young dysphoric child used to have a really strong in-person peer group. And then due to a variety of reasons, maybe the pandemic, social isolation, being stuck at home, maybe some kind of depression, they transferred all of their attachment to online friends. And these are mm. online friends that are part of trans specific kind of social networks where you have that hot boxing as it's called, which is like you announce trans in a discord chat and everyone tells you you're wonderful, you're beautiful. And then also that kind of criticism of cis people that you talked about earlier, which Helena brought up. So I wanted to point that out with, it's not necessarily that your child is going to have a lot of in-person friends that identify as trans only. It might also be that their online relationships are purely focused on gender identity. And then another thing that stood out to me in terms of the social contagion aspect is one particular quote that I'll read from the study, the detransition study. Respondents uh, detransitioned for a variety of reasons, and most frequently endorsed reason for detransitioning was the fact that the respondent's personal definition of male and female changed, and they became comfortable with identifying with their natal sex 60%. That is absolutely shocking because we've talked a lot about words in this debate. Helen Joyce has done a good job of lifting that up. But so much of these online communities and this ideological perspective is focused on redefining words. So the fact that most of these individuals credit basically messing with language as being a major reason that they have detransitioned really tells us something about the way social influence and narrative plays a role in this whole transition process. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's fascinating. And, you know, my observation is that one thing that, that comes up is gender roles and stereotypes. And 
back in the 70s, there was really um, efforts made to reduce these very rigid stereotypes of, you know, girls can only do these things and boys can only do these things, you know. So, um, you know, great. It was a record. Now it's probably a CD or a free to be you and me. And, you know, it was all about there are a lot of ways to be female. You can be female and, you know, you could drive a truck and you cannot wear makeup or you could, you know, like to wear makeup or you can, you know, they're just all different ways to be female. And as a male, you could be nurturing or you could like sports or things like this. And so I think we were moving in the right direction to say, you know, there are a lot of ways to be female. There are a lot of ways to be male. And I feel like in the past decade, we've brought back very rigid stereotypes in order to reject them. So I've seen on social media people saying, well, if you don't like shoe shopping and you don't like, you know, and you're female, and if you're male and you don't like beer and saying bro, that means you're gender fluid. So that I think is the wrong direction um, to basically bring back these stereotypes. And so I don't even like the word gender nonconforming. I think we should be saying gender stereotype nonconforming because we've heaped all <laughs> Always of these... Always one for the catchy phrase there, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, we've heaped so many definitions onto this poor word gender that it almost doesn't mean anything anymore. So, you know, I think gender stereotype nonconforming is the way we should go to talk about people and the variety of ways that they, you know, live their lives. And I think we need to bring back words like um, personality and interests and aesthetic and fashion sense, because I think that's part of part of the problem as well. So if somebody likes to wear jeans one day and a dress the other day, it means that they have moods and they have an expansive, you know, fashion sense or not even that expansive. It doesn't mean that you're that you're gender fluid. Like we should be talking, well, is, are we talking about personality? Are we talking about fashion sense? Let's, let's do that because you can be female and have any personality, any interests, any hobbies, any fashion sense. And the same is true of male. So that's where, that's where I, my thought on the, on the rigid gender roles. And I think in back to the question with the detransitioners, um, there's their definition of male and female changed, and then they became comfortable. I mean, so I think language is very powerful. And if, if we're using language in a way that people feel that they're not ticking all the boxes of what makes somebody feminine, and that means that they're not female, you know, I think that's a problem. So, so yeah, so I think that's really, it was an interesting finding to me. I was, I was surprised that that came up at the top of the list. I, I think that's fascinating. Everything you've said. I love the fact that you're, you're trying to think, cause I am too, of different terms that more appropriately describe this what's going on maybe gender expansive but like I don't want to get into any sort of um confining kind of um labels but it does feel very personality driven and it, it reminds me of my own teenage years and everybody's that we were all mad into the I Ching and the Enneagram and things like that like it's very natural for teenagers to be into personality types star signs what is the what are you and what am I and what's my flavor and what's your flavor and that's been happening and it was so I was so into it as a kid all that Enneagram stuff and I still am I think Myers-Briggs all that sort of stuff it's very interesting and in many ways the gender identities is more and more feeling like personality descriptions as opposed to mm -hmm. gender identities and uh, yeah, I, and I wonder what would happen if we changed the language yeah, around it. Yeah, um, like the genderbred man or, or the genderbred person. Yeah. Like you know, it talks about you know gender, sexual orientation, and things like that. If we just said, you just put in personality, fashion, sex, yeah. or whatever. And, yeah. And um, can I ask you? We, we, it's funny because I've just been discussing that exact concept with somebody. So hopefully there will be kind of initiatives coming out around that. Exact, exactly where you're going at. But um, did you notice, can I ask you, very much difference between female and male, you know, transition, detransition, where are their differences? Because biology makes a difference. Oestrogen and testosterone make a difference. And I'm not in stereotypes here. I'm just saying, did the data sh show differences in this experience? Yeah, well, I did some analysis to to see where uh, the males and females in my sample were statistically different. And the numbers were were small. 
Um, so I couldn't really do that for every single aspect. But what did come up in the in the data that was statistically significant is that the ages of the females were younger when they transitioned, when they detransitioned, and at the time of the survey, than the males at each of those points. Um, the the females were more likely to have experienced a trauma less than a year before the start of their gender dysphoria, and they were more likely to have felt pressured to transition. And so those were the, the things that I, that I looked at. And also they were much more likely to be um, lesbian and bisexual than, than males. And can you, can you remind the listeners what percentage of the respondents were female and what percentage were male? Um, 69% female and 31% male. So, you know, if you think about what these global changes have been in the shift from predominantly male to predominantly female, my sample looks much more like this recent shift the, of gender dysphoric patients. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm remembering that the natal males were transitioned for a longer period of time before they detransitioned. Is that correct? Yes. And it was much wider range of, of time. Yeah. And so the, I did report most of the, the findings separate for male and female. And I think there are differences that really deserve more research in terms of the experiences. So the, the ordering of the, you know, reasons for detransition and things, uh, you know, like that were different between the males and the females. So I do think there does need to be more um, research um, to really get at those differences of experiences between males and females. It, it really felt when I read the study that it was an indictment on therapy and the therapeutic experience for quite a lot of people. And I did notice that, for example, 60% of the participants detransitioned because they felt more comfortable with their biological sex, if I'm right. You're nodding, so I am. Yeah. And that uh, seems to me the realm of therapy, that 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 mm. could have been a, a transition that could have been avoided. If if they detransitioned because they became more comfortable with their biological sex, they could have not tr transitioned at all. Right. And the other part of that is that there were 23 percent um, who had experiences around internalized homophobia and difficulty accepting themselves as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. And so it was this discomfort with their sexual orientation that they experienced as gender dysphoria and a desire to transition. And detransition was seemed to be more of accept, finally accepting themselves as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. And I think that fits really nicely into what you were saying, that you know, exploring this discomfort around their sexual orientation would have been a great place for a therapist to help them. And that that could have been a transition that was avoided or at least, you know, entered into with a better understanding. It feels like mistakes were made. When I, when I read it, it felt like mistakes had been made with these with these. And I think of I'm in the IATDD with Sasha and I think of the detransitioners I've worked with. And, you know, like I'm talking about teenagers whose therapists were trans and how the, the teenagers didn't feel that they could explore their fears because they didn't want to offend the, the trans therapist. That it just doesn't feel right. I did notice, uh, I, I don't want to go into too many statistics, but there, there, it's an extraordinary study and it has so much rich, rich data. But 38% um, transitioned, they believe, because of trauma and abuse and difficult experiences. Again, where was the therapist? Right, right. And then we, we don't want to forget that there was a subset <laughs> That that were happy with their transitions and did detransition because they were discriminated okay. against. So so yeah no and I think what was that I think it's great to twenty percent or something is it? Um, I think twenty nine percent were part of the you know expressed the narrative where discrimination and pressure from other people. Um, twenty three percent. I've just looked it up. Well, no, this is the that's 20, for a reason, but actually the narratives, okay. the, there were 29 percent that that included sort of this external pressure, you know, and these are heartbreaking stories also about people who were 
um, who were taunted for not passing, who felt that they um, needed to get a job, you know, that they couldn't hold a job if they were transitioned. You know, there was one person who's... Um, whose partner threatened that that they would not see their children. I mean, so these are very serious and heartbreaking as well. Um, so, but I do think it's, you know, it's important to mention, but I do think that this other aspect that we're talking about now, the, the, these other topics are new, you know, so these, uh, the, the discrimination story we've, we've known about for a while, and we should continue to care about that and work on, on, you know, on those issues. But also this this newer area where we're where we're seeing people saying that no, my gender dysphoria was really from trauma or mental health disorder or for for homophobia because this really speaks to the complexity of gender dysphoria and why we shouldn't be thinking in terms of there's one cause and one treatment that people are more complicated than that and if you fail to evaluate people, you're going to give them the wrong treatments. So. And, and they're not mutually exclusive. You know, like when I was reading the study about those individuals who were taunted for their appearance or for transitioning, I thought, gosh, you know, appropriate therapy would have been so helpful for everybody in the, mm. in the study. Any respondent here, had they had compassionate therapy that examined their themselves as a whole person and a person within a context, a family context, a history context, a trauma context, Appropriate therapy can help with all of those things. So mm. I don't think it's um, an either or kind of situation, which really goes back to what you started us off with, that there, there seems to be a bizarre dichotomy that's been evolving that isn't really accurate. Yeah, I think it's I, I think it's a really, really amazing study. I think it's amazing work you do. I think you're an incredibly special person. I think the, the world of gender, I think people who have, have gender dysphoria and their families are so lucky to have you because what you've done is you've you've had the not only the courage, but the rigor and the attention and the kind of the absolute kind of decency to keep your ethics front and center of your work and just to keep going. And I really I'm so appreciative of you. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, I really feel very strongly about this issue and that there's so many people who aren't being listened to and, you know, and their voices are important. And it's important to understand all of this. Like we should be welcoming all of the information about about these experiences, whether they support or challenge our preferred model. You know, this is this is how you help people like I want to know what's true and what's not true as opposed to be reinforced in what I would like to believe. Because if you don't know what's true and what's not true, you could end up hurting people instead of helping them. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. This podcast is sponsored by Rhyme and Genspect, and our listener support means a lot to us. The best way to help is to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Follow us on social media, and if you'd like to make a financial contribution, you can donate on our website. Just go to our link tree. That's linktr.ee slash widerlenspod. Our discussions are for educational purposes only and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.